your new home for podcasts and original music. The Zagnif One Radio Network. are taking on the number 21 Texas Longhorns. I'm still wondering when they're going to be back. Sam Ellinger said they were going to be back like three years ago. Um, just comes to mind on that list that you're like, hmm, like th- this, they, they could they could shock the world. Nathan, Nathan, Nathan. What? you want this? Hold Nathan, on. Nathan, 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 Nathan. Nathan. Wait a minute. Stop Nathan. this, Skip. Hold on. How, how, uh, how are we looking at this? This Is this a walk-off or is this going to be like a like the Florida game? Bam, about three touchdowns. Here we go. Get already. So here's the next question. I well, not a question. This is our. This leads us to our next topic. And ladies and gentlemen, this week's segment is brought to you by 1906 Tees. They can hook you up with some absolute bomb uh, custom T-shirts. Also, another company that generally caters to Greek letter organizations, but can make you whatever custom T-shirt gear you want. They can't do logos. None of these companies can do logos because those are NCAA copywritten, but they can do mascots. They can do team colors. They can do custom messages on the front and the back. You want to picture yourself like this with it, holding up a UGA helmet. You can do whatever you want to do. But visit my man Rick over at 1906Ts.com today. All right, let's talk about something that I've been wanting to talk about for, uh, well, I haven't wanted to talk about it for a while, but I've always wondered. I remember being a kid, and as a kid, um, when you were out of school, one of the things that I like to do, of course, I was a latchkey kid, so I you know, stayed at home by myself a lot. But one of the things that I like to do in December, in addition to um, you know, listening to Christmas music and sneaking and eating some of the Christmas sugar cookies and things like that and the candy canes and all of that was watching bowl games. Like, because you got to watch bowl games during the week instead of having to wait until Saturday and you had the Peach Bowl and you had the Hula Bowl. And, you know, in, in 1980, there were only 15 bowls, though. Uh, you know, you had the Peach Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, the Orange Bowl, the Rose Bowl, Sugar Bowl, Citrus Bowl, blah, blah, blah. And at that point, you only had to have, I mean, you not only had to have, but you had to have a minimum. I looked it up. Every team that was in a bowl game back then had at least a minimum of eight wins to be bowl eligible. So that meant that you had to be in the upper tier in order to get a bowl bid. Because there were only so many of them. That was an exclusive club. That was like the mid, that was like members only, just like those little funky jackets that we were wearing back in the day with the little strap on it. I never forget that. The side note, I wanted a members only jacket really, really, really badly. And um, I think mine was kind of rust colored, rust brick colored. And it wasn't a members only, but it looked just like a members only. And and I took the little strap and folded it up in the collar so it wasn't hanging out. I folded it up in the collar like everybody was wearing them. And uh, man, that was you couldn't tell me nothing because I had even though it wasn't the members only, I had my members only jacket. But yeah, so it was an exclusive club. Now, you know, flash forward to 2020, and now there are 35 bowls, which include the CFP, and you only have to have a minimum of five wins. Chew on that for a second. You only have to have a minimum of five wins. In the FBS division, you have to play 12 games, except for the cold coronavirus shortened season last year. You only had to play, you, you only had to play, you had to play 12 games in a regular season. So now less than 50%. So you are passing with less than 50%, which means that the best product in the NCAA. It's not being put on television. And a lot of times these games are televised that you live on the East Coast and your team is out on the West. Your team is out on the West Coast playing in the in and out Burger Bowl in uh, San Jose, California. And yeah, it's seven o'clock in San Jose 
but it's 11 o'clock on the east coast and if i got my time zones wrong whatever don't 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 at me with that so you're at 10 o'clock the game starts and the average football game runs three and a half three to three and a half hours nobody wants to stay up that late to see their team play now the thing that brought this on I uh, was listening to the morning show on 107.7, the franchise here in Oklahoma City. Shout out to uh, 107.7, the franchise, their morning show with Todd Lizenby and Eddie Radosevich. And they were just talking about how the bowl games have become too much. And the question was posed, like, what if, in addition to expanding the college football playoff to 12 games, that they did it just like the pros? where the lower tier bowl games, that first level tier bowl games, where the teams got a home playoff game, the impact that that would have and the interest that that would generate from the fans would, would, would add value to those bowl games because it's going to be a brand new product that they're bringing out. And so here i mean think about it let's just let's just give you let's just play what if okay you know let's play what if you live out in washington you're a diehard lifelong season ticket holder fan for the washington huskies the huskies win six games and they get a bowl game you're like hey they're going to the bowl game yay we want to see them go to the bowl game and well, let me fix that. I got to fix the numbers. Let's just say they got enough. They managed to, um, let's just say they managed to win the Pac-12. How about that? Because I, I forgot. I'm sorry. I had to fix the scenario to make it fit. I had to fix the record to make it fit the scenario. Again, need more of this. <sighs> okay, so let's just say the Huskies win the, the Pac-12. And they get an invitation to the college football playoff, the field of 12 that they're proposing. But they're playing in the Peach Bowl in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, I crunched some numbers here. So average cost of a plane ticket between uh, $25 and $300. But we're not, we're not talking about those travel sites like Travelocity or whatever. You're talking about traveling during the holiday season when the cost of the plane ticket is going to be higher. So it's going to be more on the high end. So you're talking about $300 a ticket. And it's you and your significant other or you and your best bud. So now you're talking $600 for plane tickets. And because it's a CFP game, bowl game, those tickets are going to be more than the average football game. Those are averaging anywhere from anywhere from three to five hundred dollars a ticket and that's for cheap seats so let's just say you're going for the cheap seats you got a couple of cheap the two cheap tickets for 600 bucks that's 1200 dollars for tickets to go to a cfp game then the average cost of a hotel in atlanta right now is between about 100 and 200 dollars. that's november that's free holiday that's no bowl games or big events in town. Bowl season during the middle of the holiday, you can go ahead and bump that up to about $500 or more a night. So now you're not going to go out there and just fly in town, see the game, fly in town, see the game, and trek all the way back over to the airport, get on the plane and go home. No, absolutely not. You're going to get yourself a hotel. You're going to take time off from work. You're going to go down there on a Friday. You're going to stay Friday night, go see the game, maybe have yourself a few stay Saturday night and fly back home on Sunday. So now you got a thousand bucks a piece for the hotel. Two grand. And uh, I'm sorry. I was looking at tickets earlier. The $600 is the cost of tickets. So we're talking CRP tickets could be about 1200 bucks a piece and your flight flight. You can catch a cheap flight on Travelocity or whatever, but again, it's the holidays and you're traveling. So you, so you're looking at about anywhere between out of pocket, the both of you together, four to $5,000, $2,500 a piece. I don't know about you, but I'm not a big baller like that. I don't have $2,500 that I would want to spend. I love University of Georgia. Now, if the CFP, if they got a bowl game at the, oh, say the Cotton Bowl, I'll get in my car and I'll drive down to Dallas and I might 
uh, find a friend or two that lives in that area and crash on their couch and go to the game. And then I could eat that water burger and I could bring my monkey ass back up the road to six hour trip back and back to where I am. You know what I mean? Versus that kind of money. But I just could not see my I couldn't fathom spending money to fly out the money that I don't have during the holidays to go out to California to the Rose Bowl. Much as I love my dogs, I am not balling like that. So basically what happens? You've seen it. Those of you that are absolute diehard, must watch every game football fans. You've seen those bowl games on TV in the half empty stadiums. And then it's become such a little priority to the teams that the teams aren't even, all of their players are not going. The second and third stringers are going out there because the juniors and seniors are like, man, I ain't going to play in no BS, BS, uh, sugar baby. Uh, the sugar, the sugar baby candy bowl out in uh, Buck Tussle, Mississippi, to to play in front of uh, twelve thousand people, and no, I'm not going. I'm I'm sitting this one out and playing for the draft. So you got the added expense for the fans of making a trip. You got the teams not even making it a priority if it's not a CFP game or a New Year's Six game, and so what you get is basically. Uh, basically 29 games of just absolutely inferior, inferior, inferior product. Now, not all of them are horrible because you do get those bowl games where you have some team that comes in and they barely, they barely squeaked out seven wins and they beat somebody who comes in with 10 wins that didn't win a conference championship. So you do get that every now and again, but what, what just think about the impact it would have on the football community as a whole and what it would mean for the fans if those lower tier entry level entry level playoff games could be played in a home stadium you know what i mean if i was oklahoma born and bred for example and let's say uh the sooners managed to get a playoff spot in the in the uh, group of 12 and they've got a home game in norman Oh, Norman's not that far down the road from here. I'll get in my car, drive down to the game, and come back. No big. I, I know some folks down that way. Hey, man, you mind if we hang with you or just someplace we can stay? Boom, boom, boom. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's no expense in that. You've got a stadium full of screaming Oklahoma seeing Sooner fan, Boomer Sooner, all over the studio. And the Sooner Schooner, which drives me notice at a much uh, slower rate since it took a took a big spill in the middle of the field uh, a couple of seasons ago. Um, that's just, it's huge because, but here's the flip side of that. Do I foresee that happening? Who knows? I think that the 12, they say that they'll never do a 12 game playoff. They will. You know how I know they will. As soon as everybody comes to the table and figures out how everybody can get a number of a dollars that is, amenable to everybody involved it will happen this just they weren't ready they weren't prepared for this yet they're not prepared for it because it never was a serious discussion but now that it's a serious discussion i can guarantee you there are some talks being had behind closed doors about who's going to get what money what money goes to what conference what money goes to what school how does this work out how do we still do all of this add all of these teams and still manage to generate revenue and come out in the black instead of coming out in the red so I, I I can foresee the 12 playoff thing happening, but here's why I don't foresee these folks giving up these bowls that soon. Again, money, 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 money. That's what it's all about, right? Give me the money. That's what I want. Um, the average revenue for 20 for bowl games in 2020 is $549 million. That's right. A five, a four, and a nine followed by a comma, followed by three zeros, followed by another comma, followed by three zeros, 549 million per bowl, which got divvied up between the two schools, the two schools conferences, blah, 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 and then the revenue to pay off the organizers. Speaking of the organizers, and this is from a 2017 article in USA Today, the organizer of the Cotton Bowl in 2015, made $1.2 million. Part of that was a $560,000 bonus. So that means that without the bonus, 
this guy still made $560,000 in his pocket. Now, do you think that somebody that is making $1.2 million for organizing a bowl game is going to say, no, I won't let that bowl game go down to Norman and let Norman, you know, because they're giving up money out of their pockets. Now, I really think that they, I, I, I just tell you, there's too much money changing hands for the bowl games to go to home games. But God, wouldn't it be great to see that, though? Can you imagine that those of you that follow your favorite teams and you're you're looking every week and you're like, I'd go to the bowl game, but now nah, I'm not I'm not traveling. I'm not traveling that far. Some, you know, it's turning into it's basically turning the only people that are going to the games are the 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 boosters that have the money to make the trip that even feel like making the trip. And the folks that are putting on the the folks that are putting on the bowl games. Um, so yeah, I think there'll be a long, I think it'll be a long time before we see that happen. Will it happen in my lifetime? Who knows? It might, it might not. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in other news, moving on from this segment in other news, you'll notice that I'm showing some love to my Savannah state tigers here. They did pull out a win against the Fort Valley state over this weekend, uh, one in dominant fashion, unfortunately, uh, as you know, they lost to Albany State, the all the Rams of Albany State in Albany State, uh, in Albany State. Oh my God, the Rams of Albany State from Albany, Georgia, in a in a uh, road loss, and Albany State and Savannah State were neck and neck. So with the head to head loss, Albany State has clinched the SIAC East. But we are still very proud of our Savannah State Tigers coming back from a COVID shortened season in which they won the SIAC East last year. You have not heard the last of the Savannah State Tigers. They will be back next season. I think they're still playoff eligible as far as that division is concerned. So we may have more Tiger football for you on deck soon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's basically going to do it for this review today. I didn't intend to come on and do over 30 minutes. I try to keep it to 10, but hey, it is what it is. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, make sure that you tune in tomorrow night for this week in SEC football, the week nine review, the week 10 preview, and we will definitely be talking about the CFP rankings because those will be out by the time we come on. So on behalf of my co-host, Sean and Colin, I am Mr. Fingers coming to you live from Zagniff Central. Appreciate you. Holla. Be sure to like and subscribe for content and more on your new home for podcasts and independent music on the Zagniff One Radio Network.